Do you know that there is only one God in three eternal persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Do you know that Jesus said he is the only way to heaven, and his death and resurrection bring forgiveness of sins to all who believe? Welcome to the Pastor Study, a ministry of pastorstudy.org. Join us now as we study God's Word, the Bible, together. Welcome to the Pastor's Study. Now and then I'll hear someone say, Oh, Pastor, ever since my husband died, I am so lonely. When my husband died, I died. And you've got to explain, No, 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 you're, you're still here for a reason. Or somebody will say, Oh, ever since my divorce, I am so lonely. Or somebody will say, I always thought I'd be married by this time in my life, and I'm, I'm so single and I'm so lonely. Rupert Brooke was an English poet who was sailing from Liverpool, England to America in 1913. There was no one to say goodbye to him. So he found a little urchin boy on the street and gave him a quarter and a handkerchief and said, little boy, for a quarter, would you just wave this until my boat is out of sight? And Rupert Smith uh, Brooks said, I got my quarter's worth. Isn't that a sad story? Well, today I want us to talk about loneliness. Jesus knew loneliness. The loneliest night of Jesus' life, I believe, was the night that he was betrayed and all of his friends ran away. So let's, let's look at the Bible now and ask, what is God's advice for the lonely? Take out your Bible, if you would. We turn to Genesis chapter 2. Let's pray. Father, we pray now for anyone who's experiencing loneliness and utter loneliness, that your Holy Spirit would come teach us, Lord, how to find comfort and strength in the hour of loneliness. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. What does the Bible say about loneliness? The first thing that the Bible says about loneliness, it is not good. Genesis chapter 2, God makes Adam, and it says, God made man, and God said, It is not good that the man shall be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him, and God creates Eve. So the first thing that talks about loneliness in the whole Bible, Genesis chapter 2, it's not good that the man's alone. I'm going to make him a wife. <laughs> Second thing, the Bible teaches about loneliness. The importance of being with people. Jesus had 12 disciples. He could have had no disciples, but instead he chose 12 disciples. Why? It says in Mark chapter 3, Jesus chose 12 disciples, quote, to be with him. Even though Jesus is God, when he became a man, he knew that we are social creatures. Humans need humans. And even though his humans let him down a lot, Jesus still cherished his human relationships. He says this uh, in, in Luke chapter 22. Disciples, you are those who have stood by me in my trials. I grant that you may eat and drink in my table, at my table in my kingdom. So Jesus cherished human companionship. So did the Apostle Paul. When Paul would go around the Roman Empire preaching, he didn't do that by himself. He would take Timothy or Silas or Barnabas, and he traveled with people because he knew there was an advantage to that, which leads to the next thing the Bible says about loneliness, the advantage of others. Listen to this from Ecclesiastes chapter 4. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. For if either of them falls, the other will lift up his companion. But woe to the one who falls when there is not one to lift him up. Furthermore, if two lie down together, they keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? And if one can overpower him who is alone, two can resist him. And a cord of three stands, strands is not quickly torn apart. The advantage of others. There are definite, I, I think the devil wants to you, you to spend a lot of time by yourself, cut off from human beings, because that can breed depression, anxiety, alcoholism, sexual sin. So if you would be healthy, spend a lot of time with other people. 
Ulysses S. Grant was the president of the United States, but of course before he was the Union General of the Civil War. According to the story, Grant had a drinking problem. His closest confidant was John Rawlins, and uh, he was the lawyer that Grant made the uh, chief of his staff during the war, and it was to Rawlins that Grant pledged, I will not drink during the Civil War. When Grant fell off the wagon, Rollins is the one that went to him and implored him for the sake of your health, for your sake of our nation, get back on the, on the wagon. And Grant did. But one writer, I like what he says here. Listen to this. In front of the Capitol in Washington, D.C., there stands the magnificent monument of General Grant sitting on his horse in characteristic pose. But at the other end of Pennsylvania Avenue is Rollins Park, where there stands a very ordinary statue of Rollins. Whenever I stand before the great statue of Grant on his horse in front of the Capitol, I remember the other monument down the street of the faithful friend who kept Grant on his horse. <laughs> we need to be with other people. Don't spend too much time alone. I, when I spend too much time alone, I can get kind of weird. Spend time with people. The next thing the Bible says, loneliness is bad, but the next thing the Bible teaches, alone time is good. Alone time with the Lord is good. Uh, it, Jesus said in, John, in Mark chapter 6, disciples, come away by yourselves to a lonely place and rest for a while. Do you know that sometimes the most important thing you can do for the Lord is to just get all by yourself? Martin Luther in the 1500s had to hide out in Wartburg Castle for a year because the empire was trying to kill him for starting the Reformation. So all by himself for a year in a castle, do you know what he did? For the first time, he translated the Bible into the common German language, and it was a huge achievement. You've heard of um, John Bunyan. John Bunyan did many things, but he's known for one thing that in 1672, when he had to go to jail for a long period, he wrote the great book, Pilgrim's Progress. Um, the greatest epic poem in the English language is Paradise Lost, written by John Milton. Milton did not write that until after he went blind and had to withdraw from public life, and then he wrote the greatest epic poem in English, Paradise Lost. And think of the Apostle Paul. Paul had to spend alone time in jail more than once. That's where he wrote the letters, the epistles of the New Testament. So, you know, sometimes Christian workers, well, I got to get busy and do this for the Lord and do that for the Lord. The main thing you have to do is get alone and be alone with the Lord. That leads to the next point. Alone time doesn't just happen. You have to make it happen. You will never have time for the Lord. You have to make time for the Lord. And I've shared this many times when I was a young preacher, an old white-haired Lutheran pastor said, Tom, you need one hour alone with the Lord or you'll burn out. And I will tell you, I don't put a full hour in every day, but I often do. And I, if I don't, I kind of burn out. I need my alone time with the Lord. Many years ago, a, a very powerful preacher by the name of McLaren, uh, Andrew McLaren had a powerful preaching ministry. And one day, a, an assistant said, what is the power, is the secret to your powerful preaching? And he responded, I owe all to the simple habit, never broken, of spending one hour a day alone with the eternal from 9 to 10 in the morning. Often he would put his Bible on his lap and read his Bible. Often he would just pray during that time. But he did not read the Bible during those times for preparing his sermons. He read it as a child would read a letter from his father. 
Matthew chapter 14 says, Jesus sent the multitude away, went up to the mountain by himself to pray. In other words, sometimes you have to say goodbye and get rid of the good things to get the great thing. So I encourage you, have a regular prayer time with the Lord. Now, you know, and don't be legalistic about it. If you don't put in a full hour or full whatever, half hour, it's not like there's a dark cloud over your head, but it's so healthy. <laughs> Next thought about loneliness, the advantage of widowhood. If you're a widow, I have a good verse for you. This is from 1 Timothy 5. Now, she who is a widow and who has been left alone has fixed her hope on God and continues in prayers night and day. So if you're a widow, you can look at that as, oh, poor me, and my life is over. Or you can think, no, wait a minute, there's an advantage to this. Now I have time to spend with the Lord. <laughs> and one more lesson here. Alone time with God is the priority in life. So, a couple days ago, I'm going to spend my hour in the morning with the Lord. And I say to myself, well, okay, let me just fix one thing first, and then I'll come, come back to prayer. And, well, I noticed my, all my, pic my pictures, not all of them, but a lot of them from my iPhone disappeared. So I went to my laptop. My pictures had disappeared. So I called up Apple technician. I was on the phone for an hour and a half. And then something else I got caught up in. And finally, after hours of frustration, I just had to go in my bedroom, get on my knees next to my bed and say, God, help me major in the majors, not in the minors of life. Your quiet time with the Lord should be a priority for you. I'd like to close now by just sharing with you Three verses that comfort the lonely. Here we go. John chapter 16, Jesus is about to be arrested, and he says to the disciples, Tonight you're all going to scatter and run from me and leave me alone. But I am not alone, for the Father is with me. And, and take this verse to heart. The Father is with you. The toughest night of Jesus' life, all alone, he was not alone. Do you remember the Old Testament story? Evil king Nebuchadnezzar throws Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fire. And he looks in and, I don't see three men walking around in the fire. I see a fourth. <laughs> that was God. <laughs> Ernst Shackleton and his two men were trying to reach the South Pole in 1907. Their small ship was wrecked and they spent 16 terrible days on the open sea. Then once they got to land, they had to hike 36 miles over ice to get to a safe place. And Shackleton recorded these words. I know that during that long march of 36 hours, it often seemed to me that we were not four, excuse me, that, that, we, that we were not three, but we were four. And my men, Worsley and Creon, had the same idea. When you're going through a trial, regardless of how you're feeling, you really do have your Heavenly Father with you. And then another verse of comfort. It's very similar to the one we just did. Jesus' last words on earth from Matthew 28. Disciples, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So the second wonderful thought is, Jesus is always with you. The shadow said to the body, who is a friend like me? I follow you wherever you go, in sunlight or in moonlight, I never forsake you. True, answered the body, you go with me in sunlight and moonlight, but where are you when everything has gone dark and neither sun nor moon shines? <laughs> A true friend is with you when you're in your darkest hours, and often that is only Jesus. The Apostle Paul experienced this too. He was put on trial, and he says this in uh, uh, 2 Timothy 4. At my first defense, no one supported me. All deserted me. May it not be counted against them. But the Lord stood with me. A London newspaper held a contest to find the word friend. One winner said, 
A friend is one who multiplies joys and divides grief. Another winner said, A friend is one who understands our silence. The grand prize winner was this. A friend is the one who comes in when the whole world has gone out. Paul discovered that at his trial. Jesus discovered that on the night he was betrayed. One other verse that I, I would commend to you for when you're lonely comes from Psalms chapter 142, starting at verse 5, verse 4. Look to the right and see, for there is no one who regards me. No one cares for my soul. I cried out to you, O Lord, and I said, you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. So when you're lonely, cry out to the Lord. You know, a lot of the Psalms are lonely. And I heard a preacher say years ago, it can really can be healthy for you when you're going through a rough time. Take out one of the depressing Psalms and read it out loud to the Lord. Let that be your prayer. All right, well, let me close with this. Pliny was a Roman governor in 120 AD trying to wipe out Christianity. A Christian was on trial before him. Pliny said to the Christian, I will exile thee. The Christian responded, you cannot, for the whole world is my father's. Well, then I will slay thee. You cannot, for my life is hid with Christ in God. Well, then I will take away your treasures. You cannot, for my treasure is in heaven. Well, then I will drive thee away from men, and you will have not one friend left. You cannot. I have one friend who will never leave me. So the next time you're alone and wondering, does anybody care? You've got a Father in heaven, you've got a Savior, His Son, Jesus Christ, and you've got the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, the one God in three persons will never leave you. And, and I close with this. There was a survey. What is America's favorite hymn? They, they quizzed all these Christians, what's your favorite hymn? Number one was How Great Thou Art. You know what the second favorite hymn was? I come to the garden alone While the dew is still on the roses And the voice I hear calling on my ear The Son of God discloses and he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own, and the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. That's a great hymn to sing when you're lonely. Amen. Welcome to the portion of the program where we ask Pastor Brock questions regarding the Bible. Pastor Brock, our first question today, how do I know if I should get married or single or stay single for the Lord? Yeah, we just talked about loneliness and I think the answer is 1 Corinthians 7. Paul says, you know, if you can be single, that's better. You can serve the Lord more, but because of all the immorality and temptation, let every person have their own spouse. So I think the general uh, answer is if you can really handle your sex drive, and be single for the Lord, go for it. Mm -hmm. However, most people have a strong sex drive, you need to get married. So I'd put it that way. So I think, uh, uh, read 1 Corinthians 7, see what you think it says, and I think it says that, what I just said. <laughs> but I, I will tell you, Mona, whatever lot you're, you're at in life, try to be grateful for it. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm single, I've been single my whole life. I have a buddy by the name of Marcus, a very funny guy, and he and I used to do a Christian radio show, and he was my co-host. And one day before the show started, he's talking to me about his wife and his children, and I said as a joke, Marcus, I don't have a wife and children. <laughs> and he said, no, Tom, you gotta say, I don't have a wife and children. <laughs> so my point is, if you're single, don't yearn too much to be married. Mm -hmm. If you're married, don't yearn too much to be single. Be, be happy in whatever lot God has given you. Amen. Yeah.
Yeah. All right, next question. I no longer go to church because of cliques and gossip in my church, but I do enjoy friendship with Jesus. I had to write this person mm -hmm. back and said, and I get this, I don't go to church and I love Jesus, but I don't like the church. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Jesus said this, uh, John said this in 1 John chapter 5, everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. That is mm -hmm. your Christian brothers and sisters. So if you say, well, I love God, but I don't go to church because I don't like them, something's wrong. You need to forgive people and go back to church. And, and, and I, I found this, an old question. Can I be a Christian without the church? The answer, yes, it is possible. It is something like if this is uh, going to happen. A student who will not go to school, a soldier who will not join the army, a salesman who has no customers, an explorer who never leaves the shore, a, a seaman on a ship without a crew, a businessman on a deserted island, an author without readers, a tuba player without a, 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 a it goes on and on. Mm -hmm. and on. Mm -hmm. So do you need to go to church to be a Christian? Yes, you do. Hebrews chapter 10 says, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves mm -hmm. together. That's you important. need to be in church. In, and I read of a story mm -hmm. where it saved a man's life. Here's an old guy that goes to church every Sunday. Mm -hmm. One Sunday morning, he didn't show up. And he was so regular, people thought, what happened? They, they went over to his house, they banged down the door, and he had a heart attack. But he was saved because he wasn't in church and people knew it. Mm -hmm. So I think being in church is hugely important. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, that's about it. Yep. What about that saying, you have to love them in the Lord, but do you have to necessarily like them? No. <laughs> we have to love everybody, we don't have to like everybody. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, do you have a certain way that you spend time with God? In our sermon, we talked about try to get a time alone with the Lord every day. Mm -hmm. I do it in the morning, because if I don't do it in the morning, often it doesn't get done. So, I'll tell you what I do. Um, I, like I said in the sermon, I'll, I'll read the Bible during that hour. I will pray during that hour. I like to get on my knees. Um, I also have good devotional books where you read one page a day. Mm -hmm. uh, here's a good one, Martin Luther Through Faith Alone. It's a daily devotional book on here's one page each day on Luther's writing. Uh, mm -hmm. Or here's from, somebody sent me this, Puritan devotional readings. Mm. The Puritans, like 1600s America, and they have great devotionals in here. Here's uh, Charles Spurgeon, one of the world's mm -hmm. greatest preachers uh, of foregone days. Uh, Morning and evening with uh, uh, Charles Spurgeon. So, there, you know, you go to a Christian bookstore or go online and see if you can get a mm -hmm. daily devotional book. Those are good. But my, my bread and butter is prayer and Bible reading. Mm -hmm. And sometimes then, Mona, I'll sing to the Lord. And I'll just worship during that time. Mm -hmm. So, and I, I, I think it's important every Christian has a time alone with the mm -hmm. Lord every day. Again, I've said this before, I don't make my hour every day by any means, but I often make it. Mm -hmm. And make sure you, you're spending alone time with the Lord. And sometimes they have those little booklets, d daily guideposts, oh, right at the church. We right. get them free uh, yeah, every... The best one yeah. is called Our Daily Bread. Yep. I love Our Daily Bread, daily devotionals. Mm -hmm. There's one called Daily Word, which is a cult called mm -hmm. the Unity Church. Stay away from Daily Word, but get Our Daily Bread. Mm -hmm. All right. Here is a letter from a viewer. I can't find in the Bible where it says that Christ didn't have an old sin nature because he was born of a virgin. If Christ didn't have a sin nature, then how could have he been tempted in all manner such as, as such as what we yet without sin? Yeah. What he means is, all right, it does say in the Bible, Jesus uh, was without sin. It also says he was tempted like we are, but he never sinned. Mm -hmm. Now, it's not wrong to be tempted. It's wrong to give into it. So how could Jesus have been tempted if he was not born with the sin nature that we all inherited from Adam and Eve? Mm -hmm. Well, the virgin birth, I think the reason God put Jesus directly into the womb of Mary was to override what Joseph would have passed on to him, which was original sin inherited from Adam and Eve. Now, does it, it does say explicitly that Jesus was born of a virgin. Does it ever say explicitly the reason was to protect Jesus from getting original sin? I don't know of a verse that says that. So this is a bit of an inference, but I think it's valid. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Here's another question. Pastor Brock appears to be a Catholic priest, but he said he is Lutheran. He's a Lutheran minister. Can Lutheran pastors be married? I thought of becoming a Catholic priest, but the one reason I could not is I couldn't take a vow of celibacy. 
I know eventually the church will have to allow the Catholic priest to be married. What do you think of this? I'm a Lutheran. Uh, all, all denominations except for the Catholic Church allow their pastors to get married. I don't see anything in the New Testament that says you have to be single to be a pastor. Mm -hmm. Peter was married. Mm -hmm. The apostles, some of them, were married. Mm -hmm. It's never forbidden. So, in fact, in the earliest centuries of the Catholic Church, priests could marry. That didn't mm -hmm. become a, a, a tradition until later. So, uh, will the, so I, I think it's fine for a, a pastor to be married. Will the Catholic Church ever change that? He thinks for sure they will because they have such a shortage of priests. I don't think it will happen in my lifetime. I think that it's such a tradition now in the Catholic Church, I, I'd be amazed if they, if they changed it. Hmm. So. I wonder if they have a large group of priests that eventually leave because of that issue. Um, I think more people don't go into it because of that issue. Okay. Yeah. Um, my mother was, she, who is deceased, was a Christian. Seven years before her death, she told lies about my husband and I. We didn't associate with her. We were outcast, even from our family. Honor your mother and father. Hmm. Question, how could we have honored her? Well, I have a friend whose mother is aged now and is claiming that she, her daughter is stealing all kinds of stuff from her. Mm -hmm. And none of it's true. But it's part of her dementia. Yes. And I want to give you the name, but one of the best preachers I've ever heard, he taught me at, at Bethel University uh, Bible. Well, when he became uh, elderly, he got Alzheimer's and was using the foulest language. Mm -hmm. This is the last guy on earth you think would do that. So some of this is our mind going. Mm -hmm. Now, so maybe maybe her mother's mind was going let's say mother though was fully minded and was just being malicious how do you honor your parent who's turning your family against you i think um you love them mm -hmm. you pray for them i don't think that means you have to spend time with them i think you, if somebody is continually abusing you you're not sinning by withdrawing from that person you, you forgive them before the Lord, you pray for their soul, but I, if, if it got as awful as it sounded like in this mm -hmm. letter, I think, I think honoring your parents means you love them, you pray for them, not that you agree with them or spend a lot of time with them. Mm -hmm. True. Yeah. Interested in knowing what your opinion based on scripture would be pertaining to scattering ashes or keeping ashes to put in small round globes to hang around your neck. I think that, I had never heard about that, having your daughter around your neck, yes. that's a new one for me. Mm -hmm. But uh, it sounds too weird for me, but we're out of time and we'll try to get at that one next time. Thanks for joining uh, us today. Hebrews 13, 8 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forgiver, forever. See you next time. Thank you for watching the Pastor Study. You can watch more of our programs at pastorstudy.org. We are on the air preaching the good news of Jesus Christ because of the generous support of you, our viewers. Would you consider supporting our ministry? You may do so at pastorstudy.org or write the Pastor Study, P.O. Box 41294, Minneapolis, Minnesota 55441. May the blessing of our one triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you now and forever.